Yes. Okay. It looks like now it's working again. <laughs> okay, I see. I see the problem. Okay, so distribution of mineral resources. Uh, mineral deposits are highly localized. That's a pile of good stuff, basically. They are neither uniform nor randomly distributed. Okay, you cannot draw a specific pattern for the distribution of reserves, resources on Earth. That is because concentrations of valuable elements are due to special, sometimes unique, geochemical processes. And we will look, we will have a quick overview of that uh, during uh, this lecture. But first, we, we can have a look at what we call uh, concentration factors. So basically, this is the the amount of uh, valuable element uh, we have uh, to be concentrated in one place to be economically interesting to mine. Basically, what we uh, what we do is to look at the composition of the the average composition of Earth's crust. Here and you have different metals and elements, and that's the concentration uh, on Earth's crust in percentage. And then we know that we need these abundances to have a deposit <laughs> economically interesting for mining. That's the amount required for profitable, profitable mining operation. And then you can calculate the concentration factor. So the, the numbers are a bit old, but if you look at aluminum, you have 8% in the in Earth's crust for um, an interesting uh, deposit, you need 35%. That means the concentration factor of four. Then we can go to uh, elements like uh, titanium, 0.57% uh, uh, in average in Earth's crust. But if we want to have a, a deposit that is economically uh, interesting, we need between 32 to 60% of titanium in the deposit. So that's a concentration factor ranging from uh, 56 to 105. But that is also uh, highly dependent on the price of commodity. Okay. We are, we are looking for very valuable elements to make a lot of profits, basically. Even if it's not very concentrated, we will look at the, at the elements. Now, what we can uh, do is to look at the actual abundance of uh, chemical elements uh, on Earth. In fact, this uh, plot shows you the chemical elements of the solar system. They are sorted ac according to their atomic number. And here you have the, uh, the abundance. In fact, it's normalized to the, uh, the number of uh, uh, silicon atoms. What you have to understand from this plot, basically most of the uh, rock forming elements, the chemical elements we find in uh, common minerals of uh, common rocks on, on Earth, like a basalt or a granite, that's silicon, aluminum, sodium, magnesium, calcium, iron. They are quite abundant. But if you look at other elements, elements we use in our economy, even abundantly, 
like uh, chromium or nickel, copper, you see, they are already uh, less abundant than these elements by a factor of about, uh, that is um, uh, 10,000 to 100,000. So they are not that abundant in fact. And we can compare with other elements that, uh, that are the so-called rare earth elements. These guys here, you know that the rare earth elements, for, for some of them, they are as abundant as copper. Not all of them, of course, but look at tungsten. It's almost as abundant as, as most of the rare earth elements, despite we use tungsten a lot. Lead as well is not that abundant. But then we look at very rare stuff and that all these guys, basically we have the uh, platinum group elements, rhenium, osmium, iridium, they are less abundant by a factor of, um, I think that's 1 billion. So this stuff is really rare in the solar system and on Earth. And that's also the case for gold. So if we want to have enough um, um, concentrations of uh, uh, these elements in a, in a deposit, we need to have process that uh, basically concentrate these elements in one place. And that are the ore deposits or the mineral deposits. And then we have different types of uh, mineral deposits. Basically, we have uh, four main uh, types. And uh, the first one is igneous uh, deposits. They are uh, directly, their formation is directly connected to uh, a magmatic body. We have also uh, the metamorphic metasomatic uh, deposits. That's a huge family of different deposits. They are associated with a heat source. We will uh, talk about that a bit later. We have also uh, sedimentary deposits. They are basically formed uh, through uh, sedimentary processes, depositions, deposition of particle, particles, or you have also deposits that are formed within sediments. And finally, we have uh, mineral deposits that are formed at the surface of the, the planet, the very surface of the of the crust, and that's the supergene deposits. We will go through all these deposits um, during the lecture. But first, we can start with the igneous uh, deposits. We can uh, uh, distinguish uh, three uh, types of igneous uh, deposits. The first one is probably the most important in terms of uh, volume and also in terms of what we can get in terms of elements. That's the pegmatite deposits. A pegmatite is a very, very peculiar rock. It's a rock made of uh, basically giant crystals, giant minerals. We are talking about meter size uh, uh, minerals. And because of the formation of pegmatites, uh, we expect to find very weird uh, minerals, minerals that contain elements that are not usually included in other um, minerals that form the, 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 the rocks on Earth, the, the common rocks on Earth. So a pegmatite, it's a coarse grain igneous rock with interlocking crystals, usually found as uh, irregular dikes. 
that means um, basically a big slab of uh, uh, volcanic rock or magmatic rock cross cutting all the other rocks and uh, geological formations. We can find also pegmatites as lenses or veins, especially at the margins of uh, big magmatic intrusions, that's uh, batholite. And uh, pegmatites are, um, contain, as I said, uh, many minerals uh, like uh, mica, tourmaline, uh, beryl, and uh, also um, um, lithium bearing uh, minerals. And some of them, some of these, uh, some of these uh, minerals are gemstones. The second main type of uh, igneous um, deposit, they are layered ultra basic intrusions. Basically they are uh, large magmatic bodies, but they are layered. You can see different uh, uh, units within the, um, the, in, the, the, the magmatic body, and that is formed by uh, crystal uh, settling in the magma chamber. The, the minerals, once they are formed, are heavier than the remaining liquid, and they sink into the, the, at the bottom of the magma chamber. So, and uh, we can uh, form uh, layers of, uh, form almost by one single, single type of uh, minerals, of mineral. And uh, we can find minerals like uh, chromite uh, in uh, this kind of uh, deposit. Um, uh, type localities, of layered basic uh, intrusions. Pushveld in South Africa, we will talk about it uh, in a few minutes. And uh, Isle of Rum in, uh, in Scotland. To uh, give you um, uh, an example of uh, layered ultra basic uh, intrusion, uh, Pushveld is a uh, uh, the place of uh, several mining operations in uh, South Africa. I forgot to show you this, uh, this beauty. This is uh, a spodumen. It's, uh, it's one single crystal. You see the size? 4.5 by 0 0.9 by uh, 0 0.6 meters. This is the kind of uh, mineral you can find in pegmatites. And spodumen is a, a pyroxene. It's a common mineral um, in, uh, in, um, in lavas, in basalt. And uh, it's a lithium pyroxene. Uh, finally, the last type of uh, igneous uh, deposit, kimberlite diatrems. Diatrems are... Um, uh, volcanic vents, they are uh, fennel shaped. And uh, the, the kimberlites are uh, a very uh, rare type of uh, magma. And we think they are, uh, they originate from the mantle. Kimberlites are uh, gas rich. They are ultra basic, that means they are enriched in magnesium and iron, and they go uh, through the surface. And because they are um, gas rich, when they are close to the surface, you have a volcanic explosion, and that forms a jet drum. Uh, kimberlites are very interesting because they contain diamonds. So, Let's uh, look in details at uh, pegmatite uh, deposits. You have here a picture of a pegmatite uh, of a pegmatite that is a single uh, feldspar. So we are talking about big, big crystals. And again, 
pegmatites are very peculiar because usually they form at the end of the crystallization of a magmatic body. So basically you have left everything that, that do not go into the common uh, rock forming minerals. Okay. And that means you have a lot of weird minerals and a lot of metals that do not enter in the commonly found rock forming minerals. So I uh, show you a quick example of um, a pegmatite deposit. That's the example of Pitika in Zimbabwe. It's uh, actually a lithium uh, tin cesium pegmatite. And this is basically uh, on this uh, sketch, how it looks like in cross section. We have the, the, the country rock, the, the host rock here and here, and sandwiched in the, in the country rock, you have a lot of different uh, layers and uh, subunits, if you want, and they are, characterized by a, a, a specific type of mineral or an, a specific association of minerals. For example, here you have a layer of a, a feldspar here. Then you have a layer which is burial rich. Uh, here you have a layer containing lepidolite. Lepidolite is a is a mineral that is uh, that belongs to the, the the clay family and it's a lithium bearing uh, mineral so that is really interesting if we want to mine uh, to extract lithium then we have a, a zone here where we have quartz quartz is interesting if you want to make to make glass and here, our friend, the uh, lithium uh, pyroxene, spodumene. Where is it? Here. And here, we have this lens made of petalite. This place is the best place <laughs> for petalite. It's the Apparently, you can find the best petalite in the world. And petalite is this kind of uh, mineral. And it's also a lithium bearing mineral. OK. And finally, here we have a zone where we have spodumen and feldspar. If we go even more in details uh, when we are uh, looking at uh, Pegmatites. I give you just an example of uh, uh, lithium pegmatites. We can find up to 11 mineralogical and textural zones. So that's very complex magmatic uh, body. It's a very complex geological object. And uh, basically, we see this. Uh, we have usually five zones. Uh, so this is a very simple sketch to show you what we can, can, what we can uh, find. Uh, basically, we, we start from the center, the nucleus. Usually, we have pure quartz. And in this area, we are talking about min uh, minerals, crystals that are several meters long. Then uh, in this uh, zone, we start crystallizing uh, lithium mica, lithium tourmaline, and beryl, which, uh, which contains uh, beryllium. And then we switch to the, the, the next zone, if you want, the inner zone. The main uh, mineral uh, association is quartz and feldspar. We can find also a bit of mica, but in terms of uh, lithium bearing minerals. Uh, we have also uh, uh, formation of uh, uh, 
uh, lepidolite, and uh, we have also tantalite, which is a niobium bearing uh, mineral. The next uh, zone, the intermediate zone, is dominated by mica. mica. We can find quartz and feldspar. The size of the, the minerals is much smaller, still 10 centimeters. That's a pretty decent for a crystal. And we have uh, spodumene, uh, phosphates, and lepidolite in terms of uh, uh, minerals of uh, economic interest. And finally, the last zone, uh, name the marginal uh, zone, we have tourmaline and mica, a bit of quartz, and feldspar. So pegmatites, in general, they are complex body. We have a lot of weird uh, mineralogical associations. And usually we find in this stuff a lot of interesting metals. Just a bit of, uh, say, uh, local geology uh, tourism or interest. The Itterby mine, it's uh, in the Stockholm archipelago, in the Vaxholm uh, municipality, if I am uh, correct. And in this place, we have discovered, have been identified yttrium, uh, that's terbium, erbium, and ytterbium. The last uh, three are rare earth elements. So you have funny names uh, for the streets. And you add a mine. Apparently it looked like that. And you can still find something like that. That's a feldspar, 15 by seven by five centimeters. That's a, that's a nice feldspar. It's on my, uh, on my balcony. So the point is, it looks like that. I, I could just leave you read the, the sign on the mine, but I, I will uh, just um, give you the basic info. Basically, the mine was uh, operated for feldspar and, uh, and quartz for the porcelain industry that's related to feldspar and glass industry that is related to quartz. And uh, uh, many famous uh, chemists, I would uh, say they were in fact geochemists like uh, Arrhenius and also uh, Gadolin investigated the, the minerals from this place and they discovered the, the elements I mentioned, yttrium, uh, ytterbium, erbium, and uh, ter uh, terbium, yeah, I have all of them. Okay. So if we look a bit in details, the, the rock look uh, like that. I think this uh, star pattern you see on the picture that's, that was made probably by, by explosives. But in a, in a more close look, this is what you see, and you see there's black patches. They are gadolinite, full of rare earth elements. Okay? So just to remember, pegmatites, that's good stuff. Uh, now we can switch to the next uh, uh, type of um, igneous uh, deposit, and these are the layered igneous intrusions. As I said, they are formed by a crystal settling, sinking of crystals at the bottom of the magma chamber because they are, the newly formed minerals are denser than the remaining liquid. That's uh, something we uh, see. Uh, it's a classic process in, uh, in magmatic bodies. And usually uh, we have formation of uh, uh, chroma chromite uh, layers 
that's a magnesium, aluminum, chromium oxide. We have formation of uh, magnetite uh, layers. That's uh, an iron titanium oxide. And we have formation of iron sulfides. And among them, we have pyrotite, pentlandite, and pyrite. And they, are, uh, they contain also nickel and platinum group elements. So that is interesting for, in particular, uh, the PGEs. About uh, type localities, I mentioned already Bushveld. You have the, the same kind of uh, uh, layered intrusion in uh, Sudbury, also in Greenland, Skagard. You have to keep in mind, we are talking about huge, huge magmatic bodies. And I will give you the example of the Bushveld intrusion. And this is where you can find it in South Africa. And you see the scale. I think that's uh, uh, kilometers, dozens of kilometers. That's super big. It's not continuous, but nevertheless, it's super big. Uh, as I said, you can find uh, mining operations on the on this uh, layered intrusion, uh, because in fact, what you see in cross section is that you have a succession of different rocks. They were formed by this process of uh, uh, minerals sinking into the magma chamber. So you start with uh, something like uh, an autosite on the top, which is made out of feldspars. First bars are relatively light. And then we, we go into Gabro. You have first bar, but you have also pyroxene and a bit of olivine. First bars, um, pyroxenes are heavier than first bars. Olivine are heavier than first bars and pyroxene. And you go deeper and you have something that is getting denser. You have a bit of complication. Uh, here we have bronzite, which is made of uh, pyroxene. Uh, here we have uh, another uh, pyroxene, uh, pyroxenite, um, a rock made basically of uh, pyroxene. We are talking about more than 80%, a bit of olivine sometimes. But that, the black layers here are chromite layers. If we look again at a cross-section, a bit more simplified, this is what we see. We have different zones. And uh, at some point, we have a magnetite layers here again. And then we have uh, what we call the critical zone. And this part of the Bushveld is very interesting because we have chromite layers but it's very enriched in uh, sulfides. We have a lot of PGs in this uh, layer. That's the Mir uh, Mirensky Reef. So keep in mind, big intrusions layered and these layers are formed by uh, uh, sometimes one type of uh, a mineral. Oops. So that is the, the core process to form these layers. We have a magma chamber, which is uh, could be uh, cannot be close to the surface. It has to keep the the heat, uh, the initial heat, and basically the minerals start crystallizing and they sink and they form layers. One type of mineral crystallized according to the physical and chemical uh, conditions. That means temperature and pressure. Minerals are specific to temperature and pressure, but also chemical composition. You change the chemical composition of the liquid. 
you change the type of mineral that is crystallizing. That's why you have layers of different composition. You can see that a little bit uh, more in details on this uh, sketch. We start forming uh, olivine. They settle down at the bottom of the magma chamber. They are super dense because they contain a lot of iron, a lot of magnesium. Then we start crystallizing uh, chromite, slightly less dense because you have more aluminum. And then you form a, a layer made by uh, chromite only. The chemical composition of the liquid, of the remaining liquid, has changed between the uh, formation of the olivine and the chromite. And then it keeps changing. And then we switch to another mineral that is uh, plagioclase. And then you form a layer of plagioclase. And that is the, the top layer uh, in the Bushveld. That's an autosite. Once. I have a question on the previous slide. You had like different chromites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. So that's something that I don't get now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nature is very complex because you, you have formation of uh, layers. Uh, sometimes they can, uh, how to put it simply? Uh, well, the magma chamber, it's a, it's a mesh. You have liquid, but you have also solid. So sometimes you have uh, convection, within the magma chamber. So basically you steer the, the stuff. And sometimes what happens is that you have, it works very well for plage. You form a layer of plage, but it's in the middle more or less of the magmatic body. It's floating within the liquid. And once it reaches um, a certain density, it sinks press the liquid and then you the liquid that is pressed as a different composition you have different processes magma chamber processes are uh, complex we know that some processes like uh, what i i told you this convection within the chamber you can have also reinjection of fresh uh, magma into the chamber, something that has not uh, underwent crystallization. The fresh batch goes into the chamber, start crystallizing, and you on the top of your 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 layer of uh, plage here, you start crystallizing another layer from this fresh batch of uh, magma, and you start with the first mineral. Olivine. So you, you can have a succession like that. Olivine, chromite, plage, olivine, chromite, plage, et cetera, et cetera. Plus complex processes. It crystallized on the wall of the magma chamber. It collapsed. So basically it spread on the top of the, of the, the previous layers. Fantastic. Magma chambers are fantastic. So back to the, the real thing. This is what you obtain. That's chromite, and I guess that is olivine. I can't really see, but that close to the screen. Okay, so more like uh, for layered intrusions, more like uh, uh, a dynamic process compared to uh, pegmatites, say. Okay. The last one, and uh, we will have a short break. Uh, Kimberlite's uh, diatrums, as I said, they are basically uh, funnel shaped uh, pipes. We believe that the, the <laughs> Kimberlite uh, magma com comes from deep within the, the crust or 
even in the mantle, it comes from very deep. It's full of gas. When it's close to the surface, it explodes and creates this kind of uh, geological object. Within the, the, the diatrum, you have a lot of material. You have fresh magma. You have also blocks from the country rock but you have also stuff that the, the kimberlite magma brought back from the depths. And one of the things that it brings back to us is that that's diamond. And diamond forms at depths, it needs pressure. And kimberlites are the only uh, magma producing uh, diamonds, and we find them only in diatoms. Okay. Question? But, yes. Yeah. Are they actually producing the uh, diamond when exploding, or is it more no. like the diamond no. comes up with the? No, it's, it must be very deep. Okay. Because once you, the the explosion doesn't produce much pressure. So basically, the explosion it's the, the explosion releases the pressure. You don't create it. So the diamonds were produced in depths very deep. Actually, we don't really know. We think about two hundred kilometers deep, hundred fifty. <laughs> so that's uh, what we think. Um, what causes the color of the diamond? Uh, I would say that's the impurities. So diamond is pure carbon, but you still have uh, some elements. And I think that's what creates the color of the diamonds. Okay. Actually, it's longer than I expected. You are, actually, that's not my lecture technically. So um, we are halfway. So <laughs> you want five minutes breaks break and uh, we come back. Yeah. Okay. So we have a break. Any question on Zoom? No, no questions. We'll follow. Okay. Fine. Thanks. Salad in the refrigerator. Salad in the refrigerator. Well, pure salad, 200 grams salad. <laughs> uh, good. Uh, there are no stupid questions, but uh, minerals and metals, are they interchangeable? What you mean? I think in the first slide, when you're about the definitions, I was trying to analyze what uh, the difference between metals and minerals were, but I was thinking that, you know, ore, mineral deposit, and it's kind of like varied where metal was and mineral was. So I was thinking, uh, what's the difference between metals and minerals? Well, Metals, uh, well, you can consider them as uh, a chemical element that enters that, yeah, chemical elements that enter into a mineral. Okay. okay. I will do it uh, well, no, old I school. Think I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, um... I will do it old school. Yeah, just there in the, the small corner. <laughs> Two atoms. Okay, it's, it's very simple. You have an object which is made by 
two different atoms with a well identified structure. Exactly. Yeah. That's the mineral. Yeah. Atoms could be silicon, could be iron and titanium. Usually, most of the chemical elements on Earth, they form minerals. Some metals do not form, strictly speaking, minerals. We call them native, like silver, like mercury. You can find them as pure metal on Earth. And pure metal, you mean 100%? No, you have impurities. Come yeah. on, nature is not. No, 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 no. no. I, I mean, I'm a bit uh, novice in this. No. Well, it, that, that forms through a geological process, whatever it is. That means uh, it's, uh, it's not perfect. So, mm -hmm. do you. It was a good explanation. I think I actually, I finally made it. You know, we always see this metals and minerals and such. You know, when you it always says- You, didn't, like, you didn't go to my course about uh, minerals in the our natural resource um, um, course. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. No, you didn't. And the like, like you said, it's a gas with magma, which it turns. Um, does it, like, does the crystallization happen fast enough that there's still gas inside? Or does all the gas? Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a magma. That means it's a, it's a mixture of gas, solid, and liquid. Uh, at some point close to the surface, the gas is not uh, dissolved anymore in the liquid. And that that makes the explosion. That the explosion. Yeah. But does all the gas like dissolve and uh, does it accumulate, or is there still some? You, like, like I some guess. Bubbles or I guess once you are close to the surface, uh, you have. You have already some degassing. Uh, you have already some crystallization. Yeah, but what is faster? No. <sighs> depends. Okay. Depends. Uh, depends how fast the, the magma is ra uh, rising toward the surface. If uh, you have a lot of, uh, say, fracture in the country rock, <coughs> it will go faster. But if the magma has to dissolve the country rock, digest it, it will take some time. Crystallization will happen. Uh, maybe a bit late, but you are recording soon. Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Okay. I don't know if I can make it in half an hour. Okay. You ready? All right, let's start again. So you can see you can see the, the slide on Zoom. Yeah. Fine. Okay, so we start again. Now we switch to the second main type of uh, mineral deposit, and that is uh, the metamorphic metasomatic mineral deposits. I uh, I would say that is a a very big uh, family of deposits. You have a lot of different things, a lot of different types of deposits, in fact, different processes.
that resulted a different uh, types of mineralizations and that resulted in a complex classification. So we have different ways, different, uh, um, uh, how to say, we have, depending if we describe the mineralization, depending if we describe the formation process, we have a classification. Main classifications, I would say four of them, deposits classified according to the occurring mineralization. Uh, for example, you have um, a very uh, uh, famous type of uh, deposit that's iron oxide, copper, gold, uh, because it's uh, economically very interesting. You have, uh, we will talk about that. We will talk also about porphyry copper deposits. So that different mineralization, different uh, type, a different box to classify the deposit. Uh, deposits classified according to the formation process. We will see that uh, a little bit later. Uh, deposits formed during uh, metamorphic uh, processes uh, opposed to uh, deposits formed during uh, hydrothermal uh, activity. Well, usually when you have metamorphism, you have you might expect some uh, some hydrothermal activity. Sometimes distinguishing between two processes is very complex, very difficult. We can also classify the deposits according to the uh, temperature formation. And we can also classify the deposits according to the geological setting where we can find them in a say more or less systematic way. Uh, subduction uh, setting versus mid ocean ridge uh, setting. And we will see that uh, in a moment. Uh, within this uh, metamorphic, metasomatic uh, deposits, we can uh, distinguish uh, four of uh, uh, four different, uh, say, subtypes. We have uh, disseminated mineral deposits, basically the uh, interesting, the economically interesting uh, uh, mineral is uh, scattered within the host uh, rock, but it's uh, concentrated enough to uh, be uh, a worse uh, while ore. We have also Metasomatic mineral deposits, they are formed by the action of a fluid in the vicinity of a magma body. Uh, a large family of deposits as well. Uh, so I mentioned already uh, the iron oxide, copper, gold deposits. We will talk also about apatites, apatite, iron uh, oxide uh, ore, like in Kiruna. Uh, the third type, hydrothermal uh, ore deposits. Uh, that's a mineral deposit that precipitated from a hot um, aqueous uh, solution that could be associated uh, with uh, a magmatic body or not. We have a lot of uh, uh, mineralizations associated with this kind of uh, um, uh, or deposit uh, that could be uh, uh, that could also occur as veins. And finally, we have uh, volcanogenic uh, deposits. And the best example for this kind of deposits, uh, it's the volcanic uh, massive sulfide deposits or VMS. They are black smokers, and we will talk about that uh, quickly. For the uh, for three of these uh, deposits, the metasomatic, hydrothermal, and uh, volcanogenic, we have always fluids involved. Okay, you need to transfer the elements using the fluid. 
uh, a bit more details about the disseminated uh, mineral deposits. Uh, as I said, the the ore mineral, the the, the mineral of in, uh, of economic interest is scattered within the host the host rock. Typically, that's the case for the porphyry copper deposits. And here you have a sketch that uh, shows you uh, roughly uh, how uh, it forms, how it uh, occurs. We have a magma, uh, magmatic body and we have uh, different zones uh, around uh, part of this magmatic body and uh, surrounding these uh, zones, we have an area where we have transformation of the rocks, mostly by heat. And then this is where you form uh, minerals of economic interest. And you can locally concentrate a uh, few elements. It might look like, like that. You have a, a weird framework uh, of uh, mineralization. This is what it looks like in real rock. Could look also like that. You have uh, veinlets of uh, sulfides and you have also uh, nuggets of sulfides scattered within the rock. And uh, this is what it uh, looks like uh, in uh, another way. To uh, illustrate that, you have a, a magma body and you have different uh, zones with different mineralizations, but you have an, basically an, an outer shell which contains uh, scattered uh, minerals that contain the uh, elements of economic interest. Looks like a tooth. <laughs> it does, indeed. It could be giants. Yeah. Old giants. Right? Mm. Very big giants. Okay, let's switch to the next one. So metasomatic mineral deposits. Minerals formed in the close vicinity of a magma body by chemical transformation of the contrary rock, but also the newly formed magmatic rock with the, the help of fluids. Basically, we are close to a magma body. You have a lot of heat, you have a lot of fluids, and you have a lot of chemical uh, reactions. You transform the minerals, elements move, and then you form uh, ore deposit. You can find uh, three types of uh, ore, uh, three uh, shape types. Uh, of uh, this kind of deposit, inverted cup, hollow cylinder, and tabular or inverted bowl. Uh, in this, uh, in the uh, inverted cup uh, case, the, the formation of uh, ore minerals happens uh, in the host intrusion and the country rocks. Same thing for the hollow cylinder, but for the tabular or inverted ball, it's uh, only in the uh, country rock. An example of this kind of deposit, it's a uh, uh, iron oxide, a copper gold deposit, and specifically apatite iron oxide uh, ores. They are referred as uh, the Kiruna type. We have a massive magnetite associated with apatite, which is a uh, phosphate. And this phosphate is particularly rich in rare earth elements. Uh, this uh, apatite iron oxide uh, deposits are usually associated with uh, subduction zones. So a lot of magmatism, a lot of fluids coming from uh, the plate that is going into the uh, mantle. But we can find also this kind of deposit 
in extensional settings like uh, uh, continental risks and uh, possibly uh, mid-ocean uh, uh, ridges. Uh, they form uh, lens, lens, uh, lenses shaped uh, or disc-like or bodies. And they occur from the Paleoproteozoic, we are talking about 2,500 million years to 1,600 million years. And that is the case for the uh, Kiruna uh, deposit. But we have also quaternary uh, deposits, and that is the case of El La uh, Laco in, uh, in Argentina. Uh, few more details about this kind of uh, deposit. Uh, 355 deposits and prospects worldwide. They contain also low titanium uh, magnetite as a main uh, ore mineral, uh, fluorine-rich apatite, and we have also uh, hematite, which is an also an iron uh, oxide. Very big uh, deposits large sizes, high grades. Uh, for Kiruna, we are talking about uh, reserves of more than 2 billion tons and uh, an ore grade more than 60%. Uh, finally, uh, how they form. The origin is not fully uh, understood. It's an ongoing debate. <clears throat> two main uh, line of uh, thought. Uh, automagmatic formation, that means high temperature associated with a magmatic activity or hydrothermal uh, ore formation, low temperature, we are talking about something like up to maybe 400 degrees. Uh, but typically I would say to 200 associated with a chemical transformation of the rocks. Uh, the Kiruna type uh, is the dominant source of uh, iron in Europe. And Sweden is the country with the dominant concentration of Kiruna type or deposits in Europe. So that's good for Swedish economy, I guess. Uh, now we can uh, look at uh, hydrothermal deposits. That's a mineral deposit that precipitates from a hot aqueous solution, as I said, with or without uh, involvement of a magmatic body. We have a large uh, uh, range of mineralizations. And basically, this is uh, how it works. You have a heat source, you have a lot of fractures, you have water coming from the rain, could be also water from, um, uh, could be seawater, could be also groundwater. So the, the water circulates within the fractures, within the, the porosity, the pores of the rocks, and eventually you transform the rocks, you mobilize the chemical elements, and at some point you uh, crystallize, you precipitate new minerals that concentrate different uh, chemical elements. So that is uh, two uh, ways to uh, represent that. It's more or less the same. What you have to keep in mind, fractures, fluid and a heat source. Water circulates carrying chemical elements and at some point the, the solution precipitates and you form new uh, minerals and then you have uh, ore deposits. Finally, volcanogenic <laughs> deposits. 
as the name uh, uh, indicates, of a volcanic origin. And we have this kind of deposit uh, formed in vol volcanogenic sediments, sediments that are formed from uh, volcanic rocks. But the most important thing, the most important type of deposit for uh, in, a, in terms of economic interest are volcanic massive sulfides, VMS. That's black smokers, black smoker environment. The, all the big VMS deposits we have on Earth, we are quite sure they were formed by black smokers. How uh, it works? We have uh, a mid uh, ocean ridge. We have two uh, tectonic plates that are uh, splitting apart. And just beneath the, the ridge, we have a magma chamber producing a lot of magma. Because the two plates are uh, pushing in different directions, you have a lot of fractures. This is what you see here. That means seawater goes into the oceanic crust, goes close to the magma chamber. Then you have a lot of reactions, a lot of chemical reactions. You form that eventually, but before you form this, this is black smoker. More in details, you have chimneys and you have plumes of hot water carrying a lot of chemical elements that were leached by the seawater uh, from the rocks uh, of the oceanic crust. Uh, in more details, this is uh, what uh, shows this, uh, this sketch. You have a seawater, it's cold, it's alkaline, it's a sulfate, uh, rich, it's oxidizing and contains very few uh, chemical elements and uh, metals, goes into the oceanic crust, goes close to the magma reservoir, and then it is transformed, it, it becomes very hot. So it has the capacity to leach metals and it becomes a, a hydrothermal fluid. It's hot, it's acid. It's reducing, it's rich in sulfur and contains a lot of metals. So this is what looks like uh, uh, a black smoker chimney. We have inside, we have sulfides. And as it goes toward the top, we have a uh, uh, hanadrite, which is uh, a sulfate. Uh, and here you have the plume of uh, hot uh, fluid coming out. In fact, the, 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 the black smokers, the chimneys have a life. They evolve through time. They start as small anhydrite uh, cones, and then they evolve. They grow formed by anhydrite and some sulfide, the sulfide are really localized at the bottom. And when they get uh, quite mature, you have a lot of sulfides at the base and then anhydrite is localized at the top. Eventually they collapse and they form a crust. And underneath you have a lot of, uh, um, you have a network of uh, fractures and you have a lot of fluid circulation and you form sulfides. So that's the way you form most of the massive sulfides deposits on Earth. All the massive sulfide deposits that are uh, exploited nowadays, we think they were formed like that. Okay. Okay, uh, that's the uh, third type of uh, 
mineral deposits, that's sedimentary deposits. We can distinguish uh, three of uh, them. There's, uh, there's deposits uh, result from the accumulation of or precipitation of a sediment. The first main type is iron banded formations. They are very old in fact, because they formed at the time Earth's atmosphere was uh, uh, oxygen poor. And uh, uh, what happened is that when uh, oxygen began to be released in the atmosphere, iron that was in solution in seawater combined with oxygen formed insoluble uh, oxides that eventually precipitated with silica to form uh, beds of red shirt and iron ore. We have also plaster deposits. They are concentration of uh, erosion resistant minerals or metals like gold, platinum and diamonds. And there's uh, uh, native metals and, um, and minerals uh, are transported by streams, groundwater, and they uh, accumulate uh, locally uh, when the, the water does not have the energy to uh, transport them anymore. We will look at that in a minute. Finally, we have a deep ocean precipitation of uh, uh, metals and minerals, and there's our manganese nodules. They are formed by the precipitation of uh, on the uh, deep ocean floor. Uh, there's nodules are mixtures uh, of uh, different oxides, oxides, uh, manganese oxides, iron oxides, hydro uh, oxides, and we can find also small amounts of uh, uh, copper, cobalt, nickel, and zinc. There's nodules grow like uh, um, onion uh, uh, shaped. Uh, uh, objects, they form layers, concentrate, uh, concentric layers, and they uh, precipitate uh, directly from uh, seawater. And usually we find them at the bottom of the, the large uh, oceanic basin. Just a quick uh, control question for me in regard to metals and minerals. Gold is a metal. Gold is a native metal. It doesn't combine with uh, with other elements to form uh, a gold uh, bearing mineral, mm. like silver. So you can say that Val is off there with minerals, such as gold. It's recorded. <laughs> okay. Uh, Excuse me, I have another question. You mentioned that these manganese nodules, they are, they are like onions, you see, they are layered. Yes. Is the layer sort of different in composition or are they generally the same? I would say they are different in composition, but I would not bet a, a nice bottle of whiskey on it. Um, um, I would expect so, but I um, hmm. actually I don't know. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Finally, we have a sedimentary uh, hexaxalative uh, uh, deposits, SEDEX. They are very important as well uh, in terms of uh, recovering um, valuable elements. They are zinc lead deposits and they are formed by discharge of metal bearing fluids. In fact, salty waters or brines and they, uh, they discharge those metals usually as uh, sulfides in marine sediments and they form massive sulfide uh, lenses and this kind of uh, uh, deposit 
is usually uh, very uh, good for a, a profitable mining operation. Uh, just a quick word about uh, the placer deposits. Uh, as I said, density uh, contrasts are critical. If uh, a particle is super dense, it will be deposited much earlier um, than a particle that is less uh, dense. So you obtain something like, uh, uh, like that in this picture, you have big uh, grains of quartz. And this stuff here in between, that's called small particles of gold. Uh, in details, uh, how it works, it's basically uh, all connected to the energy of water and density of minerals. If the, uh, the water has a lot of density, if the stream, the stream is powerful, it can carry uh, particles far away. But if you have uh, features like, uh, like that, you will uh, deposit uh, first uh, the heaviest particles, minerals and metals with the highest uh, density. And then you will have uh, deposition of uh, metals and elements with uh, uh, um, a lower uh, density. So you, you have to look at uh, uh, basically traps like that in streams or paleo uh, streams to uh, check if you don't have any uh, placer. You have this kind of feature as well. Basically, they are uh, uh, riffles and the, 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 the particles that are carried at the bottom of the stream to the dense particles, that means gold or platinum, and they are basically trapped by the, the riffles. And then we can expect to find uh, high concentrations of uh, interesting uh, uh, elements and minerals. Okay, the last uh, type of uh, super gene deposit, uh, of um, mineral deposits, super gene deposits. Uh, two main types. Uh, super gene means near surface process. We are really talking about uh, the surface of Earth. We are talking about no more than a few dozen of meters compared to the other uh, processes we have seen that is very, very shallow. Uh, lateritic uh, weathering is one of the uh, process to form a super gene deposit. That's the concentration of minerals due to the gradual chemical and physical breakdown of rocks in response to exposure or at, uh, at or near the Earth's surface. And that's the way you form a bauxite, which is the, the, the main aluminum ore. Basically what happens, you leach everything from the rock, you transform the rock into a soil, you keep leaching all the elements and what is left behind is iron and aluminum. I talk about that very quickly after. The second uh, way, the second super gene uh, process is secondary enrichment process. Uh, that occurs uh, after uh, the rock uh, was formed. And for example, you have a, a groundwater or stream that goes across uh, a disseminated uh, sulfide deposit. The water dissolves the sulfides, carry with it the, all the elements that were uh, basically uh, enclosed into the sulfides. And at some point, the physical and chemical conditions changed. That means uh, pressure and temperature, most likely uh, temperature, also physical conditions. 
uh, also uh, chemical conditions. And then all the elements that were uh, carried, uh, transported by uh, the water precipitate to form a much more concentrated uh, deposit. Okay. Just a word about uh, bauxite, that's the aluminum ore. It looks like that, it's really red because it's, uh, uh, it's full of uh, iron as well. As I said, you start transforming a rock into a soil and you keep transforming the soil until you leach everything, you transform uh, the, the clays in the soil into basically aluminum hydroxide. And then you have bauxite, which is that it forms small uh, pellets like that, that makes uh, Australian, <laughs> some Australian uh, uh, dirt roads very dangerous. And sometimes it's consolidated and it forms this kind of rock. So this is how it goes. You have a magmatic rock, in this case, a peridotite, which is magnesium and uh, iron rich. You alter this rock, you form a soil, and then you keep leaching, altering, transforming the soil and you form uh, an iron oxide layer. It's a crust basically. Underneath you have uh, nodules of iron oxides. This is the small pellets we have seen uh, previously. And underneath you have uh, laterites. Basically, you have to remember, start with the rock, you destroy it, physically and chemically, you form a soil, you keep destroying it, you leach everything, and at the end, you have iron and aluminum. Okay, just to wrap this up, uh, <clears throat> the demand of chemical, for chemical elements and metals in the future, uh, this is, uh, um, a diagram showing uh, what we need in terms of different chemical elements, metals for uh, electric cars compared to conventional cars and power generation. A lot of, uh, uh, what is this color? Graphite or? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I'm a bit color blind, so that's difficult for me. Anyway, what you have to, to understand we need a lot, a lot of stuff. And uh, this one is also another way to uh, uh, illustrate that. This is <coughs> the demand. This is the expected, uh, the, no, sorry, that's the, the, the curve of the of supply. That's the expected uh, supply. And this is what we need. We need a lot. The problem, if we need a lot, that means a lot of mining. And sometimes mining turns ugly. And this is what you see. Okay, that's a big hole. Maybe it's not a big problem. You can fill it with water and make some kind of uh, resort nearby. But if you want to swim in there, that's not a good idea. Usually when you have, a, for example, a, uh, mining operations uh, uh, in uh, volcanic massive sulfides or SEDEX, a lot of uh, sulfides. That means you release a lot of sulfur, sulfur combined with water and you make what? Sulfuric acid. That is Rio Tinto because it's red, because that's a, uh, uh, the famous Rio Tinto in Spain, from which the, the, the mining com company um, took uh, its name. 
The nice color here is because it's acid, all contaminated. I don't know that's that's a very weird color. I expect that is some kind of contamination. Mining operation <clears throat> is not uh, presents some um, drawbacks and uh, like uh, dealing with tailings, dealing with contamination of uh, soils and, uh, and water, even air sometimes. So if we want more mining, we have to take some uh, steps to avoid uh, disasters, basically. So maybe we can go in space and use uh, space resources for what we need. And that would be it for today. Any questions? Yeah, it's actually a small one on the black smokers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the picture image you 